Yo, Internet, what's up? It's your homie, Combat Jack. And you're listening to the Combat Jack Show podcast. What's up, King? How you doing, sir? You know, man, I'm resting, man, you know. Once again, you know, not to recap everything, for those of y'all that don't know, your boy is, um, you know, going through a crazy marathon right now with his health. And this thing is amazing, man. The love I've been getting, the strength that I feel. You know, listen, man, I lost 30 pounds in three weeks. That's not the best way to lose weight. But, I mean, I think I'm looking sexy right now. You know what I'm saying? I got a haircut. King came over the crib, gave me the haircut, man. I'm going to start, you know, now that I'm slim, man, <laughs> now that I'm slim again, I'm going to start dressing like um, the homie Dustin <laughs> from the friend zone. What up, du- Dust? What up, Dust? Dust be, <laughs> Dust be snazzy He's as sharp. fuck, man. He's sharp. sharp. He's top five sharp dudes. Sharp. And now that I'm not, a ch- not that chubby niggas yeah. can't do it, but now that I'm slim again, uh, Dustin, watch out, B. Yeah. You know, um, what are we talking about today, man? This is a... So this episode that's coming out is yes. uh, is the Steve Rifkin episode. Steve Rifkin, man. This is uh We were down at A3C a couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago. Um, you know, shout out to Atlanta. Atlanta is like the Combat Jack Show second home officially. Yep. You know, shout out to um, everybody at A3C. You know, from Ryan to Mike to who else, man? Oh, man, Mecca. Mecca. Uh, Ty, the whole, the whole tie, everybody, man. You know, Ja, Jason Mike Warburg. What up, Mike? Jason Lee from Bossup. Bossup, yep. You know, we had we we, we were very ex- uh, fortunate to see that li- that live Nas show at the last night. Shout out to the homie Just Blaze. Yeah, that was who fire. let us play on stage like children. That was uh, so fun. Too, yeah, man. <laughs> but but this but once again, man, I, I've been trying to sit down with Steve Rifkin for a long time. A visionary, he's crafted or been a part of music that really changed our whole paradigm of what we're listening to right now. I hope you enjoy it, man. It's live. But you not think I put my foot in. And um, enjoy the show. Shout out Steve Rifkin. Hey, yo, Steve, how are you, man? I'm great. Yo, man, it's such an honor to sit down with you, man. Like, you've been part of this culture from day one. Like, from day one. Yeah. I mean, you've seen a lot of shit, right? Um, yeah, I really did. Yeah? <laughs> you comfortable, man? I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Um, you know, um, let's talk about your, your, your beginnings, man. You grew up in a music business household. Yes. How did that um, influence you? Did you want to be in the music business when you grew up? Nah. Um, what did you want to do? I want to be a ball player. Really? Yeah. You, your ball, your handle? I mean, I had a little bit of something, but, you know, I never really grew. You know, then um, the thing was, I didn't know how to read or write until I was 15 years old. Dyslexia? Yeah. Um, so I was getting in a lot of trouble. And um, my, so around 17 years old, my grandfather, I was living in Miami, he called me down, and he said, two things are going to happen to you, you're going to end up dead or in jail. He goes, why don't you go um, work with your cousins, you know, your father and your uncle. I'm like, why? He goes, so you could live, you can stay out of trouble. Um, he, sp- he called my dad. My dad owned a label called Spring Records, which had James Brown, Millie Jackson, Fatback Band, which was the first hip hop record yes. of all time. Yes. Um, King Th- Kington the King Third. Kington III. Do y'all know that internet? Yeah. The first rap record of all time was King Tim the Third right before um, Sugar, Sugar Hill Gang Rappers alike. So um, he um, and the artist by the name of Joe Simon, he goes and he gives me the Fatback record, King Tim the Third. Um, I just turned 18. He goes, give me like a bag of cash and, and go see some DJs. I went, I flew down to Florida again and from uh, Miami, I drove to Alabama and I saw I was supposed to be away on the road for two weeks and I ended up being on the road for four and a half years. Did you love it? Yeah, then I, then I truly loved it. So what happened was I would go visit these radio stations and the program directors and the music directors were all my, the age that I am now. You That's know? crazy. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing with these guys? You know, so I would find myself going back to the colleges and just, you know, it was never really about money. It was always about music, girls, and, and sports. And, 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 and energy, just, right? Yeah, and just, you know, and just to love the music. Um, so that's how, I mean, shit started. So for, for somebody to be such an innovator in hip hop, was um, King, T- King Tim III your first hip hop experience? No. What was your first hip hop experience? My first hip hop experience was an artist by the name of Spider D. Spider D. Smurfy Stance. Yo, can, we, can, we, can we get the sound, sound man? Can, can we get that? <laughs> so you were Spider D. Spider D and he had a record called Smurfy Stance. And, 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 and what did that do to you? So. There was a station in New York called WBLS. There was no Hot 97. There were three stations. There was um, WKTU called Disco 92, Kiss, 
and BLS. Right. Um, BLS started having mix show DJs, and they had two guys, a guy by the name of Timmy Regisfit and a guy by the name of Sergio Manzabai. Yes. So I played the record for Timmy, and Timmy lost his mind. So it was he like, got it. he got it right away. He went into Frankie's office, Frankie Cracker, let him rest in peace. At, to this day, he's probably the biggest, most important program director in urban music. Legend. Ever. Um, and the record went in rotation. And that was literally like seeing something. It wasn't like the Fatback record, which I had no idea what the fuck it was. <laughs> I mean, this was something. And then Russell came. I, I went back on the road. And, um, you know, in the late 70s, the record business was a little bit different. Yeah. Um, it was a little <laughs> different, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, in the reception of my father's office, there were two guys like that who would just hang out the way we're hanging out right now and just, and I don't think they were security. I don't think, I mean, I think they just hung out. I mean, it was that, they said that's what their job was. Um, Make sure everything was okay. Yeah. So Russell comes in, I'm flirting with- Russell, the, Russell Simmons, of course. Russell Simmons, yeah. Um, I'm flirting with the secretaries and out walks Russell, my father, and I think Larry Smith, who was Russell's partner at the time. Hold on, hold on. You dropped some crazy names. Do y'all know who Larry Smith is? I don't. Who, who's Larry Smith? Larry Smith is arguably the first hip hop, hip -hop producer. super producer. Curtis Blow, Houdini. Run DMC, Houdini. Um, five Minutes of Funk. Five I mean, Minutes yeah, of Funk. Did yeah. he do Fat Boys also? Curtis did Fat Boys. Kurt, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but Larry Smith, first super hip hop producer. So, Russell said something to my father, you have till Monday or something like that, you know. So these two guys, five times the size of it, all of us, you know, put together, <laughs> literally ready to have Russell hanging out of a window. Like. Because they figured it was a threat. Yeah. Was and it a threat? No, he was, yeah. Russell was being Russell. I yeah. mean, just, Russell has a, a heart of gold, yeah. you know. So he just said you have money to make a decision on, was Jimmy Spicer. Jimmy Spicer. Dollar bill, y'all. So. That's when, like, I, I started falling in love from the Spider D and Sync, but from that day, and let's say 1981, to today, where it, it takes, you know, people want that quick fix. Th there's no quick fix in hip hop. No. You know. There's no quick fix in life. You know, you gotta grind, you gotta wait, and you gotta listen. So, this record came out, say, April 1981. I don't remember the exact year. A full year later, that's when the record broke. That's crazy. You know, so when these majors say, we need a, we need a record out now, we need a record, and I'm like, what the fuck, what, what the fuck are you gonna do? I have a brand new artist with me. I think right over there, his name is A1 Bentley. And I partnered up with this Korean company. And I said, it's gonna take a year. So the last week, I have Korea emailing me, when is the record gonna to be top 10? I said, call me in a year. I mean, uh, yeah, so it's like, I don't know, I don't understand the Band-Aid, like get it fixed now. It's like, we don't need a Band-Aid, man. Let's just be patient and let's, and let's fix it and let's just do it right. So you being a record guy, like you, we do live in an age where you drop an album, if it doesn't pop in the first week, people view it as a, as a failure. Is that what the fact is right now? Is that what the business model is or is it just a perception? No, I mean, th that has been the business for a minute. Right. So I'm gonna take, it wasn't a loud record, it was my SRC record company, Akon. Okay. So on, on his first album. Locked up, right? Yeah. Great uh, record, by the way. On, on the first album, when I heard the album, I went to Universal. I was going through Universal at the time, and I said, this will be the biggest artist of my career. How'd you know, man? My gut. Okay. Um, they laughed in my face. So I went to Doug Morris, who was the chairman of music, Universal Music Group. I said, I'll see you in a year. Yeah. He goes, where are you going? I said, I'm gonna shove it down everybody's face. Mm. Um, there's nobody in your company that has sold more records than me, maybe beside L.A. Reid. Mm. I said, I'll see you in a year. And he looks at me like I'm, cra I'm crazy. So my right hand, the guy by the name of Gabby Acevedo. Gabby. I said, his wife was pregnant. I said, you do the southeast, I'll do the Midwest, 
West. You know, and the record broke. I mean, that type of record broke. The two cities that are broken was Utah and Albuquerque, New Mexico. That's crazy. I mean, to this day, I, I, I still don't even understand it. Then, cut to, it's Father's Day weekend. I'm in LA with, with my kids, you know, and I'm getting these crazy calls. I'm like, what did you do in Brooklyn? I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, locked up is being played like in every car. I'm like, where are you? He goes, we're at King's Plaza Mall. And, and I'm like, <laughs> and the truth, you know, I'm saying, you know, I, do, you know, I was just talking shit. I was like, I do me, but the truth of the matter is, I didn't, the only thing that we did is, I knew New York would be last. We surrounded New York. We had Philadelphia, we had Boston, we had Connecticut. That, that's all we needed. And it bled back into New York. I call up um, the president of Universal, Monty Lippman. I said, Hot 97 is adding the record on Tuesday. And um, I didn't speak to Ebro or Tracy. I, I mean, I just knew. Ebro calls me to crack a dawn Tuesday morning. Hot added, hot added the record. That's crazy. A week later, it was already number one call out. Which is, if you don't know what call-out means, is when the radio stations research the record. It's not about request. It's like what really people think of the song. And that has never happened either. And then we were off to the races. So the, the moral of the story is, man, when you have a hot record, as an artist, as a producer, as somebody that's promoting the record, stay with the record. Stay with the record. 100%. Is there a time limit? Nope. Until you, either you run out of money or, you know, just like... You gotta feel it in here. Yeah, yeah. Does it irritate you that uh, some of these artists, like, they'll give themselves a, 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 a two week, two, a two, a two week, one month time span for a record to test it to see if they can get an audience from it? They're doing that because the labels are pressuring them. You mm -hmm. know, and, and that's what's so fucked up about the record business right this second. The, the labels, you know, sit behind their desk, they're researching, you know, they're not touching anything. You know, it's like, when I come, I, come, I came into town last night, Right? I didn't go to a club, I didn't go anything, but I went to the Walmart, mm. the closest one to my hotel, just, just to walk around to see what people are talking about. I'm not on the street anymore. I don't even pretend to be on the street. I'm 55 years old. I suffered a heart attack three and a half years ago, I had open heart surgery five months ago. So it's just like, I'm, I'm still wanting to learn. Thank you. <laughs> Yo, let's go back to when you was working at your father's label, man. There was a young intern Scott by the name of DJ Scott LaRock that worked at your father's label. How was Scott LaRock as an intern, man? Do y'all know who Scott LaRock is? Yeah. Boogie Down Productions? Mm. Okay. How did you know about that? Come on, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> Scott was great. We had the same birthday. Um, he would, you know, come and he would come in with this other DJ who I had, who DJed at a strip club by the airport. But me and Scott just bonded, you know? And then one day he goes, man, I got this MC, I got this MC. I'm like, all right, cool, bring him through. He goes, I really can't bring him through. But, you know, I'll bring you his... Why couldn't he bring him through? I don't know if he was working. I, I really, I, I didn't ask. Um, but he came with a notebook of all rhymes. You know, and, and I'm like, I'm, I think I'm cool, but I'm not that cool. I still need to hear some type of music. And you're dyslexic. You're yeah. Like, I'm not reading these fucking rhymes. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, it ended up being KRS-One. Mm. So, um, KRS-One. Damn, son. Don't, don't, don't be disrespectful. S security. <laughs> <laughs> you're bugging. <laughs> No, he's playing. That's yeah. my right. so, 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 so you, re you saw the lyrics? Saw so the lyrics. It was like in the, you know, the hard black and white notebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, literally. And I was like, a notebook full of rhymes. And it was... So when did you eventually hear KRS-One? When the fucking album was out. So that's crazy. When you, when you and Scott parted ways. We didn't even part ways. He went on the road. I went back on the road. You know, and it was just like, I met a guy in Philadelphia who was close to New Edition, and next thing you know, I'm managing New Edition. Which at, is crazy. At 23 years oh, old. You're going all over the place. We got to get to that. We got to get to that. Let yeah. me ask you a question. With regard to your association with Scott LaRock and, and Boogie Down Productions, man, out of all the rap beefs on records, man, what's your favorite rap beef of all time? Mm. Ether. The Wu-Tang guys against the Wu-Tang guys? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I'll tell you what's a very slept on record, though. Um, I think it's called um, Paper Planes when Jizza goes at 50 Cent. 
Like nobody, oh, yeah. heard, did you ever hear that? I mean, you. I heard it, but yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't even pay attention. Yeah, yeah, I mean, nobody did, but. I mean, I loved, I mean, just because it was comical to me, and I never took these beefs seriously, but right. I'm going back to the 80s, the Kumo D yellow beef. Yes. So um, that, you know, I, I just moved out to LA full time. I was making the new edition album, but that. Yo, how you, how, how is, like, you just saying this shit casually. How do you go from being in New York, you kind of at this ground level of hip hop before this thing becomes an industry, and now you're in LA managing new edition. We're not just talking about some, you know, some janky R&B group. We're talking about a legendary R&B group, new edition. We had to make an album. You know, it was the N.E. Heartbreak album. So I went out to L.A. Uh, um, my mother was born and raised in L.A. Okay. So even though she was living in New York, you know, I went out to L.A., made the album. I fell in love, um, and I stayed out there. So what, what happened for you to walk away from that? Like, what happened after? You, were, you, you managed it for two years, right? Uh, like a year and a half. Okay. And then mm -hmm. what happened? No, we just, they really needed somebody at a world level. I mean, I was, you know, I had my father and uncle helping me, but I, you know, I really couldn't do it. The, the guys were fighting. I mean, there was just so much shit going on. There so you're witnessing that whole Bobby Brown shit going on? Yeah, Bobby was, you know, Bobby was leaving the group and then Ralph was deciding to leave the group. I mean, everything that you saw in the movie is pretty much yeah. true. That's crazy. So you get, you come back to New York. No, I, I've always stayed in LA. I just, so what happened was, now I need to make money, yeah. right? My family sold spring records. I'm in LA. I don't have new edition. And I'm like, I think I have like $8,000 to my name. And I decide to put this street team together with the interns that I met all through the three years or four years that I was on the road. I said, you know what? Hip hop's coming. Radio doesn't really give a fuck about it. If we cover the streets, mm. I'll be able to make some money. But not from a label, just from the record companies. Right. So um, I took my last $8,000 to my name. I made these pamphlets, and I sent it out to all the different managers and all the different labels, from the presidents to the head of promotion to A&R. And um, I was flying to New York for a, a Jewish holiday. And um, I was going to stay an extra week. Now I literally didn't have a penny to my name. Because I, between the flights, me staying, I came back with $153,000 worth of business. Now talk about, talk about the evolution of the street team. Like, like, like just in terms of like the approach, like do you just try to put product everywhere? Like what's the approach? So, I mean, how they do it now, you know, take the digital. To me it was always, if you are who you are and, and you're a, a DJ, if you're a club DJ, if you're a radio DJ, mix show DJ, whatever, I'm never really coming at you. I'm coming at your man, who your, who's your eyes and ears. Right. And, that, and that's who I'm building my relationship with. So, yeah, then I might put you down as part of my street team or say, you know, you take care of Jack, this, that, you know, whatever, whatever it is. So, but to me, research is key. So I've been zigzagging the country for four years. So I pretty much, I'm not saying I knew everybody, but I knew enough to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So I knew there was a guy in Chicago. Um, he was at a radio station, GCI. And, we, you know, and he was a mix show guy and he, hanging out with us. He calls me one day and he says, I got this artist. Now I'm making a little bit of money. I said, all right, maybe you know, I'll do it myself, this, that. And the artist is Twister. Twister. Mm. Um, Chicago, Chi-Town. Chi-Town in the building? Yeah. yeah. So I fly him out to LA, and Twist is the first artist I signed. And um, I didn't know what I was gonna do next. And then went back to New York for my cousin's wedding, and I run into um, an attorney, and he says, I, I got you a label deal. But now at this time, I'm pretty much working 85% of all hip hop records through, through, through the street team. Right. So, so you got a label deal with one artist? I got a label deal. The only reason why they gave me the label deal was not even because of the artist, because I had this business. Yeah. And this built-in marketing. Uh, business. Yeah. So and with the like street team. This is Loud Records. This is before Loud. This is Stephen Rifkin Company. Oh, okay. Um. So I'm working. The only stuff I'm not working 
is Def Jam. But every other record, I'm working. But then Russell also knew to call me if he needed help or something. Yeah, yeah. So that's how I ended up getting the label. So while I'm flying him out, BMG called. So it, the timing of it and somebody looking over my shoulder, it just worked out perfectly. And that's how Loud, that's how Loud started. You created, the art, you created the blueprint for the street team. And then Cats took it to different areas. Now let's talk about the difference about how you ran your street team and how Diddy and Bad Boy ran their street team. Was it a playbook out of your, out of your, out of your manual? I mean, I'm probably Puff's biggest fan. Like, I, I, I mean, I knew Puff when he was, I didn't know him. I, you know, when he was throwing his parties, you know, with um, Jessica and everybody. And then um, when I got the Big Mac cassette, the McDonald's, I said, man, you I got... You know what the Big Mac... Right? Okay, I, let's just... Look, yeah, so, yeah, give him context. <laughs> so when, when Puff was starting Bad Boy, his two main artists was Craig Mack and Biggie Smalls. So this guy went out and bought all of these, like, styrofoam, kind of like Big Mac containers... And then he ran out and got all of these like buns, all of these like hamburger buns. And then he was stiff, he was stuffed like sampler. One side was Craig, and the other and one side, side was, big. was big. And he called it Big Mac. And he handed it out to like all That's the labels, all the rate. And then like, so you would get this little container and you would open it up. And it was the Big Mac promo cassette, which was fucking. I mean, big. it was brilliant. So I called him out of the blue. We had, no, we had no relationship. You've never seen that shit before. And I said, this is the most amazing thing I've ever fucking seen. I'm flying to New York tonight to meet you. And that was the start of our friendship. And then he stayed, he, was, he went through Arista. Yeah. I was going through RCA, which was both owned by BMG. And we created an alliance like we'll always be there for each other. So you helped him work his records? He didn't need help because he was Puff. I mean, he was already Puff yeah. at, at that time. Puff but, was always Puff. Yeah, so... I was, um, but I was like a major ally. Like when his deal was up and he couldn't get Clive on the phone, I had the relationship with the CEO of BMG. So it was a Friday night. You know, Puff says, I'm leaving BMG. I'm like, man, you can't leave I mean, because LaFace was doing LaFace, and, but me and Puff were the two young cats. Well, I was a lot older, but you know, um, I said, I'm having dinner with the chairman. I go, why don't you, I'll introduce you and then I'll split. So, he came in, met with the CEO. It was a Friday night. Closed, they closed out the restaurant. They both called me, and that's when he struck his crazy deal. Crazy. That's crazy, man. Um, so now you're in the record industry. What causes you to create loud records? I didn't want loud records. I'm, I'm, I didn't want a label. I was happy. I was making over, I was making six figures. I was making, I was making around three to four hundred thousand dollars. In the early, early 90s. That's like no, this is late 80s, late 80s, early 90s, yes. And, um, I was done at three, four o'clock. I go to the park. I, I still thought I could be in the NBA. You know, I'm 26 years old at five nine, five ten. Um, so I didn't want the label. I didn't want the headache. I saw what my father had to go through and everything. And then um, I'm in the city, and my dad calls me and he goes, "I'm um, come to the house." And man, I felt like I was 15 again. Like, what the fuck did I just do? You know, I'm 29 years old. He goes. I heard BMG offered you a label deal and you said no. He goes, let me explain something to you. And if, I, if you guys learn anything from this, this conversation, this is the thing that has to stick in your head. He goes, you have your marketing company, which is a service business, and you're only as good as your last contract. If you start a record company, you're gonna be in the asset business, where that money will always work for you, even while you're sleeping. And it was the first time that me and him truly agreed, and that's when I signed Loud. So with Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers, and Mob Deep's Infamous, you know, these are 20, 25 years later, I'm still leading off of that. You know, so it's so, that, that, that's what you have to. You know, let's talk about um, Mob Deep and like how you had the fucking audacity to sign artists that were unsignable, and I'll tell you why. So. I was in the, music industry, in the music industry at the time, and I was representing a young manager by the name of Dame Dash. And Dame <laughs> Dash came to me, and he said, I want to sign these young cats, poetical profit. So I, I drafted the contract. He gave it to Mob Deep. Two weeks later, he was like, yo, rip up the contracts. And I was like, why? He's like, yo, them little niggas are bad. 
I can't fucking manage them. And this is Dame Dash. She's like, and I'm trying to think, like, how bad could they fucking be for Dame Dash not be able to manage them? So how do you come in and oversee their career and take them to where they went? Let's just start. Can we talk about Dame for a sec? Yeah, let's talk about <laughs> Dame's like my son. Yeah. Um, Love that dude. Hate that dude. Right. Love that dude. So he's, I'm, I'm not in my 30s yet. I'm 28, 29 years old. Dame and his cousin, Darian. Uh, dash, dash, dash manager. They come in and they're managing original flavor. I did that deal. Dame comes in like he's little Shook Knight. Yeah. You know, and I'm looking at him, and he can't be no older than 18 years old. 18 years old. And I'm looking at him like, I love you. You are the funniest <laughs> motherfucker. I go, all this yelling is not going to get you shit. I mean, yell at Atlantic. What the fuck are you yelling at me for? You know, and I just started laughing. I said, matter of fact, you're coming to the house tonight. And then Darian said... Darian is... The, like, who, the, who talks faster? Dame or Darian? I mean... We, fucking we, drive you crazy. Right? So Darian says... Is your father Julie Rifkin? I'm like, yeah. He goes, he managed my father. Wow. And I'm like, huh? I'm like, who's your father? So his father was the first real black executive at Columbia, a guy by the name of Cecil Holmes. Cecil referred Damon and Darian to me, which is crazy. Okay. So yo, it's C coming together, yo. So Cecil was in a group yeah. that my father managed. Um, so... And that was, that's the start of the relationship of me and Dame. Like, we, nobody knows we did Paid in Full together. Yeah. That, that was Amazing movie. Amazing movie. Um, but, you know, with, with Mob Deep, they come into my office. Were they that bad? I'm going to tell you the story. Why, why they really got signed. I believed in rebels. I already had Wu-Tang, you know, because I guess I was a rebel. So um, I'm in this office, no bigger than this square right here. And it's Hav, Noid, Prodigy wasn't there, and some woman by the name of Tammy, I forget her last name. And Hav says, we want to smoke a blunt. I said, but we're not going to smoke it here. So I'm like, I'm thinking they're going downstairs. They go into the men's room, <laughs> smoke the blunt, and it's the new building that BMG just bought. It was on 45th and Broadway. And the whole fucking <laughs> um, water from not only just the bathroom, the whole floor, just <laughs> the fire alarm with water just coming. And I signed them on the spot. I said, this is what we need. This is the perfect follow-up to Wu-Tang. <laughs> Yo, did you, when you signed them, and like, you know, they were so young, man. They, was, they were kids, man. Did you envision them having the impact they would have with their second album, The Infamous? They just had something about them, man. Like, they just had, you know, swag wasn't a word then, right? Right. But they came in and they just took over the room. But again, going back, that record took a year or a year and more. Don't forget, Shook One's... So, so, so I w let, me, let me be clear. If that record dropped in 2017, it's, it wouldn't boom. be nowhere. Because, because of the way the industry is right now, it would have moved on. Oh, yeah. That's crazy. Unless you had, you know, if somebody like that would fought and grind and just figure out a way how to get it done. You know, so Shook Ones won. Don't forget, the big hit was Shook Ones yeah. Part 2. Yeah. So Shook Ones won, did whatever it was going to do, and then have one night just created this crazy ass beat, they went into the studio. My head of A&R was a guy by the name of Matty C who used to be at the source. Um, he was in charge of the unsigned hype. And he goes, we got a monster. And there was a new record conference starting in Miami called How Can I Be Down? Mm -hmm. Peter at Thomas. Peter. From uh, uh, the real, uh, real Housewives of here, Atlanta, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but I heard he lives in Charlotte Matt now. Peter Thomas, yeah. yeah. So I, um, before we left, we pressed up, this is when there was still vinyl, we pressed up like 20 copies, and the record broke in Miami. Like, f of all places. Of, of all places. Um, and then, you know, holidays are coming up, the record is still just climbing, climbing, climbing. 
And we came back to the office after the holidays. Game over. I mean, it was the biggest record in the country. That's crazy, man. You know, Prodigy, when he was alive, man, spoke about how he was one of your biggest students, man. Can you talk about how his mind worked and what the dynamic of your relationship was? I mean, him and RZA. I mean, they would just sit, you know, and it was never any, uh, any no rah-rah shit. It was, I'm learning from them. Like, I, I heard of sickle cell. I didn't know what sickle cell is, and, you know, and, and I'm trying to figure out, is there a way that you could, you know, is it your diet, this, you know, that? And we would just talk, and then he would ask me questions. He, he said, how come you don't want a studio? I said, I just don't want another fucking headache, right? right? Um, but for you guys to get a studio, a matter of fact, here's the money to have a studio. And charge loud for everything you produce in yeah. the studio. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I knew how I was going to get my money. It wasn't from the profits that we were making right then and there. And, and don't, don't take this advice anymore. But, you know, to me, in those days, it was just about the top end, the billing, and the, and the market share. So with, with me, is I'm like, charge me whatever the fuck you, you need to charge me. Because I feel I was getting fucked by BMG. Yeah. So everybody gets fucked, and then we get paid together. And, th and, that's, and that's how it was. Hey, yo, internets. Today's episode of the Combat Jack Show is brought to you by Sonos. Man, what I loved about Sonos when I first got the package and took the equipment out and setting it up and how easy it was, especially using my, you know, my smartphone, my iPhone, and just downloading the app and then, you know, just seeing how the system you know, recalibrates all the dimensions of your room so that you get the perfect sound. It's really exciting, man. And, and on top of that, man, you know, the music that I've been playing recently, I've been playing a lot of John Coltrane, a lot of Dr. Dre, a lot of old outcasts. I'm a lot of old, old Mason, you know, stuff that um, Diddy's house built. And the stuff sounds amazing, man. Sonos lets you have pulse pounding sound in any or every room at once. I mean, you could play a different song in the living room, in the bathroom, and even the bedroom or the same track in every room. Now add your existing music services or discover something new. Whether curated or on demand, free or subscription based, Sonos has you covered with access to a growing list of music services. Plus, Sonos' simple app lets you control everything from songs to volumes to rooms all in one place. It's like being a DJ playing different rooms at the same time. And right now, internets, Sonos is offering the listeners of the Combat Jack Show 10% off one order of $2,500 or less for any product on Sonos.com. This offer is available for a limited time only and cannot be combined with other discounts or promotion. So just use the promo code JACK10, that's capital jack one zero at Sonos.com to receive this limited time offer. And now back to the show. Let's talk about A1. Do your sound checks. Yo, let's talk about why you signed Wu-Tang, man, because Wu-Tang is a household name right now. But I remember being a hip-hop fan and listening to the 36 Chambers, and I didn't get it. I was like, I got to listen to it. I had to listen to it at least three or four times because it was just coming from this different dimension. Like, how the fuck do you manage nine of the grimiest motherfuckers from Staten Island? Nine. I mean, I, I don't see barriers, but... Uh, again, you know, I, I was in the same Nine. office. Nine. I was in the same. I, I was in. I was in the same office as big as this little re rectangle, not even square. And um, it was my 31st birthday, and I, and I was trying to read. RZA wasn't RZA at the time. He was Prince Rakim. Y'all remember Prince Rakim? Y'all should Google that. Yep. Exactly. Tommy Boy Records, right? He didn't have an answering machine at his house. I would call him every single day. Um, I flew in for my 31st birthday. And he just shows up in the RCA building. And I didn't have a real hit yet. Twister wasn't a real hit. I, I had the alcoholics that was buzzing a little bit, but not, nothing major. And um, he goes, I'm with the guys. I didn't know there were eight, nine guys at the time. I'm like, all right, bring him in. And he goes, we're going to have to leave the door open because there's a lot of them. So I'm thinking, okay. Small office. Yeah, no real small office. <laughs> so we put the vinyl on. They performed for me in this office. Live what record? Protect your neck. Um, as, as big as this. Somebody comes in, and to this day, I don't know if they set me up or if this is really real, but I got to check for this guy. He comes running in and says, that's that shit that I've been looking for. 
and ran out. I've never seen the guy ever, ever since. <laughs> Yo, they had a hype man. Yo. Yo, when you go to a business meeting, man, have a hype man. <laughs> hide him. Hide him. And have him like in a mailroom outfit, you know. <laughs> so um, I never saw him and we did the deal. And then when people say, you know, well, why'd you give your solo rights? You know, wait. That's one of the most unique deals of all time. All right. It's called Survival. Right. Loud was two years old. I didn't have that breakout hit yet. And don't forget, I managed New Edition. So the group, to me, is always bigger than the whole. I mean, than the solo artist. So, right, right. So I didn't know Method Man was a star. I mean, I haven't, you know, I, I didn't hear anything yet. I only knew about Protect Your Neck. And it was buzzing. So I said, as long as we have the first right to match, we have nothing to lose. And they had to pay you. The labels had to pay you every time. The labels paid me. For, they didn't have to pay me. The labels, every one of the labels paid me to market the record. So you made, you made hand over fist. Yeah. Over Wu-Tang. But once again, man, like that sound, like, like in 2017, it's a household name. But that sound was so weird. Like, like once you heard it, did you get it? Or, did you, or as, 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 a, as a marketer, do you not give a fuck what you hear? I mean, I never considered myself an A&R guy. Right. I consider myself a lucky guy, and I knew it was hip hop, but it was so raw and uncut. I said, these guys could be as big as the Rolling Stones. And that's all I said. You know, it wasn't Run DMC and Aerosmith with Walk This Way. I'm just talking about it. And if you really listen to 36 Chambers, that's a rock album. I mean, so, some of the, I mean, Clan in the Front, Seventh Chamber, you know, it's, it's th those are straight rock records. And it must have helped when they, they, they had the logo, did they have the logo when yeah. they came in? So you saw it. You saw how that logo could be flipped around to one of the most marketable logos of all time. Exactly. That's and, crazy. and if you remember on the album cover, or the CD cover, you had the W, and remember Batman? Yeah. Like with the... With the, was, with the with the, the light, yeah, yeah. At first, they tried to sue us, and we're like, "Fuck you!" You know, who um, DC Comics or Warner? I think it was Warner. Yeah. Um, but it was like, and then they said, "This is the most brilliant thing we've ever seen in our lives." That's crazy. How was it, man, working with the RZA? Man, let's talk about his brilliance. I mean, I'm still working with the RZA. Um, you know, it's 25 years later. We're gearing up for a Wu Tang 25, a Loud 25. Um, I speak to him. I speak to him. Thank you. I speak to him every day. Um, and, you know, we're going to be planning a major, major tour and just a lot of surprises. But he, he is the most brilliant man I've ever met in my life. And, you know, he, he's special. There, there's nothing else to really say. I'm not even talking about him making beats. I'm just talking about how his mind thinks. That's crazy, man. I know you got some crazy Wu-Tang stories. Like, I know about you throwing a chair mm -hmm. at a lawyer because of Raekwon. I mean, I even talk about your temper and how in high school you fought the principal. And we didn't even talk about that. But Steve used to have a crazy, you still got the crazy temper? No. <laughs> <laughs> right, Irv? <laughs> yeah. But, but what caused you to throw a chair? I, I believed in the group. I mean, we, we just went platinum. Um, we were negotiating or renegotiating the second album and Ray's solo record. And we were $20,000 apart. And the business affairs was, all of a sudden wanted to put their foot down. I'm like, are you a fucking idiot? Like, I, no. you, don't, you don't know shit about records. And I'm like, what are you doing? And, and it was a woman. I've never hit a woman in my life. And Yo, what did she do? And she says, I'm tired of your shit. Uh, Stephen Rifkin, I don't know, who the fuck do you think you are? I'm going to shut you down. We're in this 36th floor conference room. Rizza, Divine, and their lawyers already walked out. So we're at a big conference table, and, and if you look out that window, we're 36 floors up, and there's Broadway. And I'm sitting towards the end of that table, and I take this chair, and I realize, shit, if that goes through, somebody's going to die. And I, and I caught it. <laughs> Wait, you threw it and you caught it. And I threw it Slingshot. and and I threw it through the door. Is that so, basketball? Is that basketball <laughs> training? Um I threw it through the door and um 
all this glass broke. It wasn't as bad. You know, she started screaming. The other lawyers, you know, the screaming. And um, next you know, I got arrested and they walked me out of the building, you know, cuffs. And that's, but when I believe in something, I'll die for that. And and that and so did they did they soften up? Did what what happened? Like did they nah, say so we all said we all went on strike. Right. So cut to What do you mean? You're not recording, you're not I'm not doing shit. Right. Fuck them. I'm just collecting a check now. Yeah. Right? Rizza said We, Rizza, we, we sold records, so fuck it, pay me. Yeah. Um Rizza said, you know, we'll come back. Def Jam drops the Method Man album and it scans hundred and twenty thousand records the first week. Right? I'm not an email person. So I sent her a note. <laughs> Look what you did, asshole. <laughs> um, this new chairman comes in, and then you know, he said, you know, I don't, I don't want you to be a gangster. I want you to be a record guy. What do you need to get this Wu-Tang thing closed? Wow. So me and Riz met at an Italian restaurant on 57th Street, and um, he wanted at the time was probably the most expensive hip hop album. He wanted four million dollars. For, for like, Raekwon's? No. For the, for the W, I mean Wu-Tang Forever. Yeah, the double album. Yeah, and then um, Raekwon, we were gonna get, if we gave him the 20,000, we would've got for 250. That cost us a mil. And um, we shook hands, and I was like, all right, how the fuck am I gonna make this money back? I called the Brizza that night, now we all had cell phones. And um, I said, can we do a double album on Wu-Tang? He said, yeah. And, um, it's two albums. Two albums. Then I called Puff. And I said, Puff, when Biggie was still alive, I said, when are you coming? He says, let's have dinner tonight and let's figure it out. Um, Biggie was still going to come first. And then we were going to come a little later than we originally came. So then Big passed, he moved up, and we moved up two or three weeks because, I mean, the orders were just crazy. That's crazy, man. And that resulted in um, the Wu's second album and the Purple Tape. Exactly. Only built for Cuban, Cuban links. Crazy. Now, you, you're working these records, man, and, and you, you're, you're working with these groups, but you, you also start developing personal relationships with these guys, like, like, like real, like life shit. Yeah. Can you tell us the story about, uh, allegedly, um, Ghostface? Which one? There's, there Go, are two of them. W w tell us two of them. The one going to Africa because he had yeah, diabetes, diabetes and he comes back with malaria? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now, now they're major superstars, major, major superstars. And um. They didn't know Ghost comes back from Africa. Nobody knew that he had diabetes. I didn't even know that he had diabetes. And um, he's like on his last leg. Like, so, and I said, you know what? I know this doctor in Queens who, who's not for the press. He's going to keep it quiet. You know, He was John Gotti's doctor. He was like a doctor for the mob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's so, official. So I call him, and um, I have somebody bring Ghost. Because my wife at the time was pregnant. Um, with my oldest son, and I, I couldn't leave anymore. So they call me, and they said, he's really, really sick. We have to check him into the hospital. I'm like, is he going to live? We said, we don't know. Um, doctor calls me back three hours later. He's going to live, but he has malaria. I'm like, malaria? I mean, I thought that was just a word. I really didn't know that was really a disease. And, um, and it's bad. I'm like, well, you got to fix it, Stewie. You know, he goes, I got you. You know, and he literally took care of Ghost. Like, I think Ghost developed such a great relationship with him. When Ghost goes down to Florida, he, he still calls the doctor. That's crazy. And what's the, what's the other story, man? Uh, Is it an old dirty? I mean, there's some old dirty stories. <laughs> um, was their first trip out to L.A.? And he already had like eight kids, and he had a and he had a broken leg, and we just done performing at the not the palace I forget Prince owned the club at the time, but I forget the name of the club. 
And um, he goes, man, I'm, you know, I'm just going to be focusing on business. I'm going to focus on business. You know, I have all these girls, you know, I just, you know, I got so many kids. We're at the red light. Two of the most beautiful girls just pull up next to us with his one fucking leg. You know, I'm not even seeing anything. I mean, I just, I'm going. He opens up the door and jumps out of the car <laughs> to uh, talk to the girls. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that was dirty. That's crazy, man. Now, for all the hits that you locked in, man, um, it's reported that you, 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 did, you had the opportunity to sign Jay-Z. Yeah, through Dane. What, wow. what happened, man? I threw the chair through the window. Um, what year is this? I was still, I want to say. It's got to be like 92, 93. Uh, no, I just moved into my first office in New York. So 93, 94. 93, 94. Um, Dame comes and we have an incredible meeting and I'm like consider it done Yeah. This so you wanted to sign Jay yeah um, BMG never said no to me so but this is after me getting arrested me being a dick to BMG and they didn't even want a lot of money they just wanted to get on yeah, and just because, and, and they knew. Right. I mean, we really have a special relationship to this day. Yeah. And corporate said no, and I was just like, "Why? You got too many records, you know? It's like, you know." And it was the first time that I considered loud that it was real business now, like. RCA couldn't, didn't have the manpower to work the records. And I'm like, just keep on her. I'm like, it's not in our budget. It's not in our budget. And it, w and it wasn't a lot of money. And I couldn't act up anymore because now I was getting a reputation. Yeah. And as much as I wanted to act up, I couldn't. And I just said to Dame, I'm sorry. But I have even one better. Irv Gotti. We had Irv. That's crazy. I also heard you had an opportunity to sign... Eminem. Yeah, but, you know, we, we still talk about that. You know, I had dinner with Paul Rosenberg last week. Without Dr. Dre, they would, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. The, my, my A&R guys were such, you know, was Maddie and Free. I mean, they were, you know. Underground. So, under, I mean, straight New York, un, underground. underground. M would not be M. He would be M, but he right. wouldn't be 500 million M. So I really did them a favor on that. Yo, you know, one of the things I want to talk about, because I just covered this in my um, show, Mogul, The Life and Death of Chris Lighty, um, where you get to a point, man, and you take this, this small label and you blow it up to this big, like it's, it's corporate now, and you're making all this money and it's success, and at the top of the game, you're not really happy. Like, can we talk about how, you know, we all learn how it is to, to hustle in this game, but how important it is to take care of yourself first, man. I mean, I don't know if you know, Chris, when he left Def Jam, he came with me. Yeah. Um, first of all, rest in peace, Chris. I went through something. I went through this major depression. I got addicted to pills. Um, I mean, I had a $120 million company consistently. And um, I was never so miserable in my life. You know, when we sold to Sony, I went from a staff of 36 people to the first day, the following Monday, to 336 people. Where, and I'm 35 years old, and people are calling me Mr. Rifkin. And I'm like, nah, you know, this, this is not for me. I was getting panic attacks. Every type of attack you could get, I got. Um, I got addicted to pills, and I was like, you know what? I'm sending the money back, and I'm going to resign. And my wife says, let's, um, let's just go on a trip. And we go to Hawaii, and I write Matola a five-page letter saying I'm resigning. Mm. And um, Was it hard to do that, man? Or did you feel like... I, I felt like 5,000 pounds just came off my chest. Right. I, I, felt, I felt like the old me again. I didn't take a pill that day. I, I didn't... I didn't do anything. Um, wake up in the morning. I extend the trip for three weeks. I said, we're going to move to Hawaii. We're good. 
I'm playing tennis with the tennis pro, and I see four Samoans come running to the court, and there's only one person who knows where I am. Nobody else knows, and that's my mom. And I'm like, all right, this is not good. And they said, you have an emergency in the mainland. And that's when I found out Pond passed. Mm. Wow. So I was, I just resigned. I thought I just resigned, you know. And I remember speaking to Joe. Pat Joe discovered Big Pond. And, and the relation, and our relationship was, I never heard Pun, pun didn't have a record to give me anything like that, but my, I trusted my a &R people so much that Matty C, if you know him, he was a keep it real type of guy, underground type of guy. I had a royalty check from him for Mob Deep, close to six figures. It took him five months to pick it up. I'm You're like, hey, five minutes in, like, I need that check. Yeah. <laughs> right? So now... I have an early meeting with Joe and Pun because I got to go to L.A. And Maddie's in the office. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing here? And he's like, aren't we meeting with Pun? They walk in. I said, the deal's done. And they let Joe goes, if you're fucking with me, I'm going to kill you. And, and, he wasn't, and he wasn't fucking around. And I said, whatever, Joe. We have a deal. Who's your lawyer? Tim Mandelbaum, Tim represented Wu-Tang. Tim, get over here now. I have a 2 o'clock flight. This is 10.30 in the morning for hip-hop artist. Tim comes. We work out the deal. You know, not signed, but everything. And the deal was done. Maddie and Pun come up at me and says, well, what are we going to do now? I'm like, you're going to rap, and he's going to make the records for you. <laughs> I mean, what, 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 what else is there? He showed up, and I'm like, Maddie, you want your royalty check? You know? <laughs> Yo, does it bother you, man, that, that, you know, as great as he is and as, as, as um, respected as he is, that Pun is still pretty much underrated? Yeah, no question. Um, I don't know why. I mean, that's just something that... He's in your top five? He, he, he's in most, I mean, it's, it's crazy. He's in most people's top, top five. Some people won't, won't acknowledge that, though. They might be, they might be the wild card. And they might, they, they're not going to openly say Pun is in the top three. He's in my top three. Yo, Steve, who's in your top five, man? I'm old, man. So, you know, I'm still. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm old, too, man. I'm going, I mean, I'm not going to do it in any order. Yeah. But, you know, I'm going to say Eric B. I mean, Rakim. Nas. Pac, Jay, Biggie, and Prodigy. That's a good list, man. What gets you excited today about music, man? What do you hear? Who do you hear that gets you excited? Because it's hard to be in the game for this long. And I notice a lot of cats in our age, like a lot of our peers, man, they get old. They're like, I, don't, I hate this music. I don't fuck with this music. I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. And you could just see them sounding old. What excites me I got three kids, you know, and then the I kids. got and I got a lot of my staff there. I got O right there, A1 is the artist. I got Irv who's my head of A and R. And um seeing them, their energy, their passion, it's like I'm learning from them every single day. You know, because I'm not gonna go on a computer and and look for records, you know. I'm not gonna check out the blogs, I'm not you know, I'm not gonna do any of that. So I'm going to them. So when I see them listening to a record and they're bopping their head and they're, you know, they're doing their thing, that's what excites me because you know, there's a pretty big age difference, but they have passion, and that's really all I care about. And yeah, when's the last time you spoke to Prodigy? Shit. Um, probably two months before he passed. Damn. What do you miss about him the most, man? Our conversations. Yeah. Our conversations. Yeah. Um, what artists are you listening to today? You know, I'm going to keep on talking about A1. Do, um, do that work, man. A1. A1, you know, is probably the hottest songwriter in the game right okay. this second. Ty Dolla Sign, Chris Brown. He has a record out with Chris and Ty Dolla Sign nice. right now. Called, nice. Called Always. Um, who else you write? Right now. 
I mean, look how fancy he is. I, I said it. Wiz, okay. That's crazy. He didn't have that jewelry a month ago. He just got his publishing <laughs> check the other day. So you, are you still excited, man? Like, are you still excited about this? Yeah. I mean, I'm here. Yeah. You know, and it was just like, right after here, we got to go to a radio station. I mean, when I'm passionate about something, it's, I mean, that's something you're born with or yeah. you, can, you can't teach. Yeah. Last, last question, man, to the, to the people out here and the people that's going to listen to the podcast. Um, any advice for anybody coming in to this music industry in 2017? What's the, what's the main advice you got, you got to these new cats that's coming in with regard to dealing with the business, staying passionate? But um, to do your research. You know, I named my, before Loud, I named my company the Steve Rifkin Company because I wanted to be David Geffen, right? David Geffen's company was called the David Geffen Company. So do your research on Puff and really dig deep. Not, you know, the rah-rah Puff, but what really moves Puff? What moved Russell? What moved Jay? You know, and just do your research and see if that's really what you want to do and exp expand from it. But the one thing that all of us, we didn't take no for an answer. You got to figure, you know, I have a 22-year-old son who's a college athlete. He wants to quit playing basketball. D1. To fuck with this music shit. That's a tough one, man. And I'm like, you know, he's making Dean's List. He's doing everything. And he, and he left. He's not playing ball. He gave some records. We all thought they were cool. You know, then, you know, two weeks, two weeks ago, he put something on SoundCloud and it's already at two million listens. That's crazy. No money and just using his whatever celebrity he has through the basketball conference, calling all just, you know, and spreading the word. So it's like the old fashioned street team, you know, but go with your instincts too. a book can only take you so far. A book is not going to show you how to get outside that door if there's an emergency. Your head is. So follow your heart. Do your research on whatever executives you look up to and find some hit records and develop some great artists. Can you talk about real quick um, your, your venture, uh, Wave.media? Wave.media, so I, I got sick three and a half years ago. I retired. Um, Sony was just making the transition between Doug Morris and they were bringing somebody else in to replace Doug. They offered me to become chairman of Columbia Records. Wow. Me and Doug shook hands. And um, I just met with the Wave, the CEO of Wave, and she was bringing me in as a consultant until Christmas. And I was going to start January 17. So, all right, this is perfect. It's a cool little check. I had to drop my daughter off um, at a summer school program in New York. And I'm flying back to LA and I'm like making my notes, like I get this meeting, get that meeting, do your research on this person. I was miserable, you know, and I'm on the plane, you know, I'm stoned, I'm, you know, I took a pill to relax and I'm like, this is the worst. I started doing some notes for Wave and it brought a smile to my face again. I landed, I called the CEO, I said, Jeannie, I'm turning down this uh, Sony gig and um, I want to be your partner. And that's what it is. So it's a, li it's a live streaming app, but it's really for developing artists. So if you go to the app store, it's just called Wave Media. And the shit, you know, I'm not a tech guy, but it, it's really, really dope. And, you know, we're finding some shit from there. That's dope, man. We're going we're gonna to open the floor up for a few questions. Um, there's a mic set up over there and over there. So if y'all wanna just line up real quick, we got about 10 minutes. We could, you know, ask Steve and combat some questions real quick. You could ask King some questions too. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> How we doing this? No, they just gonna line up again. Good evening. Um, my name is Godwin, I'm an artist, producer, songwriter. So, um, Steve, my question to you is, I did my research about how you broke Akon up the East Coast with the um, street team and everything. 
how they didn't want to give you a, a deal for him, and so on and so forth. My question for you is, with an artist of his caliber right now, how would you break him and what would, you, what would be your advice to him? To the, the new Akon for 2017 Akon? Yes, sir. I would probably do it the same way. Um, in those days, we didn't have a video for Locked Up at first, so if you know what Akon looks like and you know what his brother looks like, we, we cheated a little bit, so I took his brother with me saying he was Akon, <laughs> <laughs> and Gabi took Akon, you know, and we just killed two birds and one stone at the same time. They didn't know what they looked like. We didn't have a video yet. Um, but you got to attack the street. And the street doesn't have to be the hood. It, you know, just find out what the base is and then go from there. It's like Locked Up Broke in Utah and Albuquerque. And to this day, I still don't understand how or why. We didn't even go into those cities. Um, but that, that's what I would do and make sure, you know, and just the game is different now. Put out as much product as you possibly can. All right. Thank you. I hope I answered what you were looking cool. for. You uh, my name, my name's uh. Charles. My bad, man. I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, my name's Charles. I'm with a company called Organic Music Marketing on Instagram, and, and that's our website. So all the artists that need marketing, hit us up. But my question to you is, uh, being in marketing, where does the value lie nowadays? You see the numbers for uh, actual physical stuff going down. You see the streaming stuff going up. So where does the real value lie for people that want to be in marketing? And then the second quick question is, for the artists that have the music, that got, like, the music is good, the product is good, they just need that extra push well like what is the what's your advice for them once the product is good I mean right now you have to go after the streaming mm -hmm. place you know when you hear about artists bitching that they don't get money mm -hmm. the label the parent Universal Music Group gets 500 million dollars a year mm -hmm. from Spotify I don't know mm -hmm. what they get from Apple so go for that how, how you have to break your artist as a marketer mm -hmm. You got to take care of the playlist. The mm -hmm. playlist are your new radio stations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, Steve, are you, are you going to be on any um, like upcoming podcasts, anything uh, like Jerry, that? Go about? fuck yourself. Are you going to be? Are you going to? No, no, no. Are you going to be like any anywhere? I know you like today. What you spoke about, I appreciate this thing. I learned a lot about you, Steve. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be on anything in the near future, like in the next few weeks? Any podcast, anything like yeah. that, brother? What's the name of your podcast? The Legendary Jerry Podcast. It launches next. There you go. When <laughs> shameless plug. <laughs> there you go. I shameless love you, plug. Jerry. Next, next win. Let me tell y'all something. And I'm not going to take over his shine. But Bullshit. this guy. This guy. Okay, I will. This guy right here gave me, I won't, not my star, but he gave me my first vice president position back in 2005, Seven. 2006. Wow. He made me vice president at SRC. So, but I have a podcast, the Legendary Jerry Podcast. Steve is going to be on there in a few weeks. David Banner is the first episode coming up uh, next Salute. Wednesday, October 11th. All right. Thank Legendary you, Jerry. Legendary Jerry Podcast. Steve, I love you, boy. Salute. Yeah, what's going on? Uh, my name is Elijah Adafope. This thing is kind of taller than me, but <laughs> uh, my name is Elijah Adafope. I'm an associate at an entertainment law firm here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I want to say I appreciate you, Steve, for coming out, man. You're really a legend in this business. My question is actually for Reggie, though. My exactly. question is, why did you stop practicing law? And secondly, mm. if, you, if you were coming out of law school 2017 as an entertainment lawyer, what are two things that you would do? Okay, so the first question about why I left the... Uh, practicing law in the music industry is the same exact reason why uh, Steve quit those jobs that he quit. Um, I had made a mark for myself, I made good money, but at a certain point, I wasn't happy. And at a certain point, I felt, you know, I was gaining weight, I didn't feel too, too healthy. And I came into this business, I remember when I was in this business and I was happy, man, and you know, by 2004, I was like, yo, fuck this, like nothing, they, you can't pay me enough to stay in a business that I'm not happy with. And I can't explain why I wasn't happy, but I wasn't happy. And I quit cold turkey, and then 10 years later, we, you know, we revolutionized the podcast industry. So yeah, you, you gotta mean, trust. He, I mean, what he did, you gotta really give Jack, you know, an Thank applause, you. because I, re I remember um, you, in you interviewed Russell a few years ago. Yeah. You know, and this is when me and Russell were partners with ADD. Yeah. And um, 
he comes to me, he goes, man, we got to do something, we got to do something. We, you know, I had no, I didn't even know how to pronounce podcast at the time. <laughs> you know, and it was like, so I really take my hat off to you, Thank you. Uh, on what you did. Thank you. And then secondly, man, as, as a new uh, attorney, man, don't wait for anything. Don't wait for anybody. Don't, you don't have to know shit. Most of these motherfuckers is, is one or two people. I know a lot of shit, though. Okay. No, no, no. But, but I'm saying, <laughs> if you know a lot of shit, just go out, man, and start doing your research on artists that you want to fuck with, artists that you feel has a potential for you and them to build a, a relationship and a career, man. Just start snatching them up, representing them, put your shingles up, and represent them, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, how you doing? My name is Brando. I don't know if you recall, I saw you at the mall at the sneaker store, and I told you. <laughs> These are facts. These are facts. I actually only really came, this is the most major one that I want to see, because I know Steve Rifkin, I know who he brought up, I know his whole backstory, and I'm an East Coast dude, I'm from Boston, so Mob D, Big Pun, you know what I'm saying, all that stuff really, really did guide my childhood, so I appreciate that, I just want to say that. But also, you're a man that um, tends to say to go with his gut. And I have to apologize, I didn't go with my gut at Foot Locker. And you know what I mean? I wanted you to hit, listen to my album. These are facts. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. Earth's, Earth's from Boston, too. Right there. Yo, that's, that's ill. I like that. Yes, sir. It was Nike Town, by the way. Oh, it was Nike Town, yeah. my bad. Boston's Adidas, though. You know that. <laughs> How's it going, man? You, I see you from Merrick. I'm from St. Albans, so you know, we real close. All right. St. Albans in the house. Best out, too. But um, I just wanted to know, what did you hear when you heard Asher Roth and Joel Ortiz? What qualities did they have that made them stand out? Because those are dudes with light voices. They don't have deep voices. They don't have that command. But you heard something in them that made you go after them. What was it? With Asher, it wasn't really, no offense, Asher, so if you ever hear this, it wasn't about Asher. It was about Scooter. Scooter Braun. Scooter Braun. Um, He's talented. He found Tori Kelly. That dude's amazing. Well, this is before. Jerry actually, did Jerry leave? Jerry introduced me to Scooter. Um, I wanted, I met Scooter and I wanted to hire him as my president of my company. And he says, I'll do it, but you got to hear this artist. So, um, and I flew them out, but I already forgot that I flew them out. I'm on my way out to go see my wife and kids. <laughs> because they lived in LA. I, I was in New York. And I'm like, what are you guys doing here? I'm like, what are you doing here? And he's looking at me like I'm on crack. I'm like, you just flew me out here. I'm like, I flew you out here. <laughs> I'm like, you want to go to L.A.? He goes, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah. I mean, we got the plane, you know. Make a long story short. He goes, I told you I had an artist that I found. So it was Asher Roth. Um, I, I liked him, but it was more about me bringing in Scooter as, as my president. So the, the one thing is, in, in a position like me, is I believe in the executives more than the artist. And, and, I'll, and, I, and I'll tell you why. An artist is gonna come and go. But if you find that right executive, he's with you for life. Mm. And then the second part, what about Joel Lattes? He was never signed to me. No, nah, but but um, he's always associated with you. It made you. He wanted to fuck my girlfriend. That's that's the only <laughs> that that's that, that's the only association. Next. There you have Thank it. you. <laughs> that's fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but yo, uh, my name is Austin Wise from Nashville. Um, I I watch Combat Jack on YouTube. Love the channel. Love the Thank show. You. Steve, appreciate your. Contributions to the game and hip hop in general, just all that. Um, my question is, as someone who you're, in, it's a business, but also it's about the people you surround yourself with and the team that you build around yourself, especially with you and your um, your blueprint for the street team. Um, what's some things that you look at when you're building that team that comes around you? What are some things you look at in the people around you? Loyalty. Look That's a good question. Loyalty. It's straight loyalty. You know, we could fight, scream, all this, but at the end of the day, we have one cause. Right. And what's best, you know, we have been saying one brick at a time. Right. And, um, and, and that's how we're going. Of course. So, I mean, to, me, it's it's a, so to me, it's about loyalty. Just, just I'll just take simple. a bullet for them, they'll take a bullet for me. That's word. I mean, yeah, that's a pretty simple question. Yeah, I just want to uh, holler at y'all. Y'all great. So, thank you. How many, how many more questions do we have? Five minutes? Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Yeah, how you doing? Oh, damn. Uh, my name is Ross Star. I'm out of Broward County, Florida. And All right. How you doing? Um, I was had a question for you. 
basically it was part it was basically like the same question he had but with the loyalty and keeping the street team together um I have a street team myself and to keep I'm a producer and to keep these artists so together your street team's in Broward yeah where in Broward do you live I'm like, a, I'm I'm in Miramar actually all right my nephews are there oh yeah 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 um I, I work with a lot of people in the area so um with my team they they're not really staying together with the loyalty and everything and that's the whole thing with they all have the same purpose but they don't see eye to eye so you as the leader one of the biggest mistakes i made in, in my career i started a company called cornerstone agency which owns the fader so rob stone to this day is still one of my best friends my childhood best friend since i was seven years old he went to law school. He went to an Ivy League law school. He was making $200,000 a year. I said, Rich, I need you. I could give you 10% of the company. I said, matter of fact, I'll give you 20% of the company and $30,000 a year. He quit. Quit being a lawyer, came as my, my partner. They didn't see eye to eye. And my ego got in the way where I thought they would both make peace because of me. Mm -hmm. So I just, I stayed out of it. But what I should have did was just nip it in the bud immediately. The three of us are sitting down and we're not leaving, we're not walking out that door until we know what each one is gonna be function. And it was a terrible mistake I made for my company, with Rob, you know, and, but if you're being the leader, you gotta sit down to your crew and you gotta handle business. Definitely, and also um, another thing, I wanted to know with a &Rs, I usually try to get in contact with a &Rs, um, from company to company and do they still even really exist right now? That's what I'm saying. I mean, I mean they, I mean, Irv really exists, but I mean the A and R's at the labels, I mean, they know how to get on a computer. Hey, that's what I'm saying. Like it, get I, with Irv. Yeah. Appreciate My it. kids went to North Broward Prep. They're still there from Broward too. Okay. I'm from Miramar, Miramar All High School. Right. All right. Appreciate it. Sir. A one. Hey, this Steve. is my new artist, everyone. We love everything you're doing, man. Um, we're proud of you. You're a living legend. Um, I, just, I had a question for you, but then I thought about it. It would be a dumb question, so I, I guess I should ask everybody by the show of hands who has a cell phone. <laughs> oh, damn. It's a lot of people. Well, could y'all like pull out your cell phone and um, purchase my new single? <laughs> it's, um, it's called Always. Featuring Chris Brown and Todd Allison. Um Always. Yeah, do do me and Steve that favor. <laughs> we don't we don't have money to get home. Oh. I'm not yeah. even mad at that. <laughs> uh, salute. Yo, salute, yo, brilliant. You taught him well. <laughs> yes, sir. So um, my name's Billy Boozer. Uh, I build software for a living, so I'm a, I'm actually a nerd. Uh, but so. You started talking about uh, Wave Media, your new company. Is there any nuance between um, doing a software company and doing uh, the production and, and all of the stuff with the music business? It seems like you started talking about patience and all those different things that seem to be very correlative. So like, what, uh, what, is there any difference between those two things? Um, between a software company? Yeah, the software company, Wave I Media. Mean, and so, I mean, have you checked out the app? Yeah. So it's dope, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's fantastic. So, so the problem is, for us, and when I'm saying us, right here, is our parent company mm -hmm. at Wave is the third biggest company in Korea. Mm. So they're a $45 billion company. Mm. They don't believe in patience because mm -hmm. when they put something out in Korea, they get numbers like this. Mm -hmm. So when I keep on saying patience, they think I'm just trying to buy time, and I'm like, Nah, if we're going to do this, you know, when you build a building, it's brick by brick. And I'm really towards that model. Mm -hmm. And you can't stop word of mouth. So mm -hmm. that's, that's my problem with my, my parent company. But yeah, it's like, you know, how long, you know, Snapchat, when did that really break? And how long was it out before it broke? Yeah. Sure. Instagram, Facebook, you know. What, Twitter. What, Twitter. So that's, you know. So you got to get it right. When you, when you buy a house, 
you want that shit working. So is the, is the point of getting into the, uh, I, guess, I guess, app space for distribution to build your own walled garden as opposed to playing in someone else's walled garden? I don't understand. So a walled garden is like a, a place where they make the rules, but you don't make the rules. So Spotify makes the rules, Pandora makes the rules, Apple makes the rules. So are you guys going to own that distribution channel? Is that the, the goal for that? I mean, we're going to make, I'm, you know, nobody could ever tell me if I want to go through a red light, I'm going to go through a red light. And if I get a ticket, I get a ticket. But nobody's going to stop. Me. I'm, I'm going to make sure I don't hurt anybody. Yeah. But I'm going to always do what the fuck I believe I have to do. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, man. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Good luck. Last question. Last question. All right. So my question, you know, um, in today's time and whatnot, being who you are, right? You sit here and you come across all kinds of music, all kinds of talent and things like that. But now it seems like there's a... It's, it's almost like now, you know, if you're just a social media celebrity type thing, cats are more focused on their social media presence and how many followers they have versus the actual content that they create. And I'm saying there's a label. As somebody who's sitting here and you're going to take a chance on somebody, do you care more about the following or do you care more about the actual art that they create? It's, for me, yeah. it's always going to be the art. It's always going to be the art? Yep. Okay. I'm just, I'm just curious. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yo, Steve, man. No, no, thank you. This hey, has been congrats. a great honor, yeah. man. And, and I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Yeah. Thank you. And to wrap up the show, you know what we do, man. Internets, dream those dreams. Man up, woman up, and live those dreams. Because a life, is dream life without dreams is black and white. And the universe flows in Technicolor and... Yes, Internets, thank you. Internets, I hope y'all en enjoyed that. Um, one thing y'all got to remember, man, you know... Your boy ain't going nowhere. Yo, shout out to my man, Taxstone. Taxstone sent me, um, I know he's going through his troubles right now. And, I, you know, to be honest, I haven't spoken to Taxstone in a long time, man. But he sent me this, uh, this tweet. And this tweet really, really inspired me, man. And, you know, I, I, I say the same thing to Tax. And I say the same thing to everybody that's going through it. And he sent me this tweet that said, we don't bend we don't break we don't shiver and we don't shake and that shit just galvanized me man so much love to the brother tax stone much love to each and every one of you out there that's supporting this loudspeakers network combat jack movement and most importantly internets you know what it is dream those dreams and then man up woman up and live those dreams because a life without dreams is black and white. And the universe flows in technicolor and surround sound. Blow. Hey, yo, internets, thanks again to Sonos for supporting this week's episode of the Combat Jack Show. Whether curated or on demand, free or subscription based, Sonos had you covered with access to a growing list of music services in any room or every room at once. And now for a limited time only, Sonos is offering the listeners of our podcast, The Combat Jack Show, 10% off one order of $2,500 or less for any product on Sonos.com. Just use the promo code JACK10, that's capital J-A-C-K-1-0, at Sonos.com to receive this limited time offer. Internets, raise your system and raise the bar.